announcement I want the deacons. Um, we have several announcements to go over uh, this morning. Amen. <laughs> so if you look on your bulletin, <laughs> on the back, there's this little thing right here. It's called a QR. The way it works is if you have a smartphone, you open up your camera, you hold it on this, it will read it, and it'll, you'll see a bar drop to open a link. It's going to open a Google document link. The reason for this is we're trying to get a directory with information out for the church and for visitors with everybody's information on it. So what we're asking is you fill that document out. It's going to be who lives in your residence, children, uh, you can put your phone number, emails, address. If you don't want to do that or can't figure it out, you can text Brother Danny and just put that information in and he will transpose it all over to a master list. <laughs> feel free. You did a good job. Feel free after church. Have Brother Danny show you how this works. <laughs> <laughs> because when we discussed this in the deacon meeting, I was like, this is not going to end up. <laughs> and somehow I'm the one that ended up here. Thank you, David. <laughs> uh, Wednesday nights, we're still having our fellowship and our meals. And the fellowship meal starts at 6, and then the uh, Bible study starts at 6.45. Again, and you not been coming to that, which I know our numbers have been getting better, but please join us. It's a good time. It's very laid back and relaxing. Uh, it's, it's a good time. We also have the birthdays uh, that are listed. Uh, before I forget, the Senior Citizens Lunch will be Tuesday at Olive Garden at 11.30. Tuesday, Olive Garden, 11.30. Oh. Um, uh, dates to remember, our church truck retreat will be October 29th, which is Friday from 5.30 to 7.00. Uh, if you want to set up a uh, car, trunk, truck, whatever, table, uh, try to be here uh, before 5.30 uh, to get set up and ready to go. Um, November 14th is our shoe boxes, which we have down here. We ask that you take those. I think the instructions are inside as far as what you can put in. And we need- They don't need to worry about the shipping because that we normally put in there because the church is gonna pay for that with the money from Bible school. So you do not have to put a check or anything inside your box this year. Unless you want to? No, do not. <laughs> do not put a check inside. If you do, it's just gonna be an additional donation because once we collect all the boxes, then I will tell them how many boxes we have, and they'll just write one check for all the shipping. So yeah. if you want to put an additional donation in your box, you may do that. Okay. <laughs> we ought to have her up there doing it. <laughs> Today would have been a great day. <laughs> As you bring those back, if you could, uh, bring them up here, and we're going to stack them uh, up here on the pulpit. Uh, so feel free to take those. I don't, and you can still get your own, right? Yes. You and, and if we use all these, I actually have more at home. So take as many as you want. Any other announcements? Well, since we're made it here, we can do as normal. So someone has a birthday today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Look, you got to share it. You got to share it on it. So, Mayor Whitewood, let's sing happy birthday to both of them, please. And, and, you guys are birthday. Well, that's Friday. Yeah, so but that's not on a Sunday. Boy, what's the rule? Oh, Angie? Oh, Angie's not here. What's the rule? I think you got to stand oh, up. Oh, my birthday wasn't on Sunday. No, you got to stand up. Yeah. No. Stand up? Uh, no. Get it, tell me. Because if Angie was here, you wouldn't even act like you did. <laughs> you got to stand up, too. Let's all sing happy birthday to Elliot. Brother Pace. And, and, and you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. If you are, if you are. <laughs> If you are a visitor with us, uh, either first time or not first time, and if you've not completed uh, the information packet, we would ask that you do so. Uh, you can drop us an offering plate or you can put it in the offering box and you leave the church. It just allows us to know who you are and 
uh, Brother Danny will try to reach out to you. Any other announcements? Any prayer requests? All right. Uh, I'll be picking up Angie tomorrow from the airport, so if you guys can just pray for her safety as she's traveling. Hopefully not Southwest. <laughs> no. Anybody else? If you would, join me in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful fall morning that you've blessed us with, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house and worship you and fellowship with each other. We just ask that you bless each family here, bless the ones that couldn't be here, be with those that are sick and have illness, be with unspoken requests, be with those traveling, Lord, and just lay your hand upon them. We ask all these things. We ask you to open and prepare our hearts for the message you've laid on Brother Danny to share with us, and then my richest lead God and direct us throughout the week. Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're marching to Zion. Sing the first, second, and last stanzas of number 392. Please be standing. Darkness cry. 
Good morning, good morning. Welcome to uh, church. I am Pastor Danny Pace, uh, and we want to thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, it's good to have you all, especially if you're here for the first time. Uh, make yourself at home, and just uh, we pray that you're blessed this morning. If you have your Bible, Let's go ahead and turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, this is the seventh installment of our sermon series through the book of Ephesians. Each week we've been reading a passage on our own and then we gather together on Sunday to read it as one uh, a body. And I encourage you uh, to go ahead and grab one of those reading schedules and to uh, join us on this journey. It's been a pleasure so far. I hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I have been enjoying it. Uh, and so I ask that you all would just get on board with us, grab one of those reading schedules and pick up uh, where we are. So far... Uh, we've learned quite a few things. We've learned that Paul is writing to a church of Gentile believers in Ephesus. And in chapter 1, he commends their faith and he prays for them. But he prays specifically uh, that they would know God more, even more than they already do. He prays that they would know their calling, that they would know their inheritance, and that they would know the power that is theirs through the Holy Spirit. In chapter 2, uh, Paul reminds the Gentile believers that they're no longer outsiders. They're not outsiders to what God has been doing through the Jewish people. Uh, through Jesus, the Gentiles have been brought near to God. They have been brought into God's covenantal promise with his people. In chapter 3, we learn that the mystery of how God would bring salvation to the world had been revealed. Through Jesus and through the testimony of the church, salvation has been made known, is continuing to be made known. And as we discussed last week, last week, uh, Paul knew that this was going to be a big task, a big undertaking. Uh, God had formed the church from two groups that hadn't always liked each other, the Jews and, and the Gentiles. And so in an effort to teach them how important it was that they love one another, he prayed that they might know how much God loved them. Because if they knew how much God loved them, surely they would find the strength to love one another. Because it was going to be love that would hold this union together, that would unite them in their calling. So today we're picking up at the very beginning of chapter 4. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 16. 1 through 16. So let's just dive right into it. As a prisoner for the Lord then... I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, 
Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given us as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. And so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and the craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Man, there's a lot of really, really good stuff in this passage. There are, there are things that you've probably heard before. There are things that might sound familiar. And there are some straight up confusing, crazy stuff in there too. Uh, this is going to be good today. It's going to be good. So pray with me. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together in your house, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here to make much of your name. But Lord, we recognize that this building is just a building with walls. It is your people that make up your church and we can worship you wherever we are. We can give praise and glory to your name wherever we are. But Father God, we are thankful for this place. God, we are thankful for those who have filled these pews for years and years and years to make much of you. We are thankful that we now fill these pews to make much of you, God. And so we glorify your name today. Heavenly Father, we ask as we read your word that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would bring understanding to us and that, God, you would strengthen us with courage and boldness in your name. Father God, I pray that today if someone is here who doesn't know you in a relational way as their Savior, God, that today might be the day that they come to find you. We pray this in your name. Amen. So let's just get right into it. Uh, the first three chapters that we've already talked about in the book of Ephesians have all dealt with deep theological truths, deep theological truths. Those are essential teachings that we need to, to stow away, to hide in our heart, and to take with us. But the last three chapters of Ephesians deal with our duty and our responsibility as a Christian, as believers. As a believer, the last half of this book is all about putting that theology that we've learned in the first three chapters into practice, putting our theology into practice. And the, the validity of that statement can be wrapped up in two words that we find in verse 1. Two words from verse 1. Ephesians 4, 1. It says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Some of your translations might say it a different way. A, a way that you've probably heard it before is, Therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you is perhaps what yours says. Two words. The first word, therefore. In the translation I was reading from, it said, then, then. The question you always ask yourself when you get to the word therefore in Scripture is, what is it therefore? What's the therefore, therefore, if you can commit that to memory? Here, 
Uh, Paul is alluding to the theology that he's just laid out in the last three chapters. Uh, in light of all of this theological truth, Paul says, what theology? Well, there's too much, right? We've, we've had six, six sermons on this, six weeks of reading about this. So I just have to give you a nutshell presentation. And in a nutshell, the theology he's laid out is that God has planned for salvation to come through Jesus and his church since the beginning of time. And that his church would be made up of both the elect in the Jews and in the Gentiles, joined together under one spirit. Brothers and sisters, theology is important. Theology drives our behavior. We live what we believe to be true. Because of these truths, Paul says, I am a prisoner. Because of these truths, Paul says, I beseech you. That's our second word from verse 1. Beseech. Uh, the translation I read said to urge. I urge you, Paul says, on behalf of this theology. I beg of you, I plead with you, Paul says, to live a life that is worthy of the calling you received. Because of this, I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. Now, there is a whole lot that can be said about living a life worthy of the calling. Uh, we're actually going to get into that. The next couple of weeks are going to be going a part one and a, a part two, all focused on what does it mean as individuals, as Christian individuals, to live a life worthy of the calling. But this week, this week, Paul focuses on living out our calling in unity as one. What does that mean? Remember, the Jews and the Gentiles haven't got along. They've been kind of enemies from the start. And so to bring these two groups together was going to require supernatural outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was going to require, as we read last week, that they learn to love each other. And so in these first few verses, Paul is literally painting a picture of what that unity should look like. What should it look like in the church to say that you're living out your calling as you interact with one another, as you love one another? And, and Paul tells us in verses 2 through 3, he says, So therefore, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of of peace. If you were paying attention, Paul says the characteristics of living out your calling in unity looks like humility, gentleness, patience, love, and peace. Paul says these are the marks of unity. They are the marks of of our unity, Plano. That is what we are to display when it comes to our, our faithfulness and being united to one another in fellowship as one body with one another. The day that our church ceases to be humble or gentle or patient or loving or priestful is the day that we cease to be unified. And if we aren't unified, we are not effective. This is what we're called to as one body. And Paul says we have to do everything we can to protect the unity of our church. It means putting aside your ego. It means sometimes taking a back seat to what you really, 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 really want. It means loving people that are kind of hard to love sometimes. It means putting on a a face of fellowship and warmth and love when you walk in the door. It means being honest with one another and transparent with one another, carrying one another's burdens 
and lifting up and exalting one another's celebration. We have to do everything we can to protect that unity, Paul says. He says, make every effort. In the original language in verse 3, it literally means to guard your unity with zeal and passion. To guard it. To protect it. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 through 6, it says there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. He's talking about the church, the things that bind them together, spiritually binding truths. And verses 4 through 6, Paul outlines seven spiritual realities, if you were counting them. Seven spiritual realities that unite the church. And they're easy to spot because just like the church is supposed to be one, the seven binding truths all share the same adjective. One. Did you notice? One body. One spirit. One hope. One Lord. One faith. One baptism, one Father. Seven theological truths. So let's look at them. In verse 4, the first thing Paul mentions is that we were united as one body. You guys know what this is all about. We, we've literally been talking about this every single week. It's kind of where we started. God has brought the Jews and the Gentiles together to form one church, one body of believers. And that truth still exists today. It still remains today that all Christians around the world, believers that you have never met nor never will until we join together in the kingdom of heaven, we are one one body, one faithful collective church of God's people. We are the church, one body. He says that we are united under one spirit, one spirit. There's roughly a dozen references to the Holy Spirit in the book of Ephesians, a dozen and, and, and Paul's primary focus it, it, throughout every single one of them is to remind the people of God that it is the same spirit that convicts them. It is the same spirit that regenerates them. It is the same spirit that dwells in the hearts of every single believer everywhere. It is the same spirit that is a sign and a seal of our salvation. The same spirit binds us together. Paul goes on to say that we are united by one hope. We are united by one hope. A hope of what? What, what is it that Paul's talking about? Paul's referring to the hope of our inheritance. Uh, we referred to this back in chapter 1, if, if, you're, if you're reminding yourselves, if you're taking notes. Back in chapter 1, we talked about Paul praying that they might have a hope or know the hope they have in their inheritance. And Paul brings it back up here again, the, the truth to all believers everywhere that we have the same hope of everlasting life. The same hope of everlasting life. We are united in that hope. That hope of eternity belongs to all of us. Paul goes on to say that we are united under one Lord, picking up in verse 5. One Lord, he says. Jesus is our Savior and our Lord. We are united under one banner, and that one banner is Jesus. We serve the one who, who died for us, who purchased our salvation and our freedom, who rose so that we might have life. Jesus, the Lord, our Lord, binds us and knits us together. He goes on to say that we are united by one faith. United in one faith. 
The phrase here that Paul uses could be understand two different ways. There's two kind of schools of thought on this. That perhaps Paul is talking about faith in regards to our belief system, our essential core doctrine as Christians, the things that that bind us and hold us together, our beliefs. And those beliefs are found first and foremost in God's Word. God's Word unifies us and brings us together. That's one take. Paul also could be talking about the faith that Christians actually express. The faith that we express. That it is the same faith that has drawn you and I near to God. It is the same faith that allows us to declare that Jesus is the Messiah, is the Christ. It is the same faith that encourages you and I to surrender to the Spirit and to walk in the ways of God. Our faith is who we are. And so in many ways, so in many ways, uh, the two interpretations actually are one and the same. Because we are united by both what we believe and in our belief. We are united by both what we believe and in our belief. United. Then Paul says, we are united under one baptism. Now, this one's interesting. There's a lot of debate over what Paul is actually talking about when he says one baptism. So you're going to have to give me a second because this is where a preacher come, you know, kind of comes in. It's like, oh, this is good stuff. All right. So just give me a second. There's a lots of debate. What does he mean by one baptism? Well, well, some people believe that what Paul's referring to here is literal water baptism. That it is the act of baptism that has joined us together as a collective, as a body of believers. And, and that's possible, except for the fact that not all Christians practice baptism the same way. In fact, some people in the Christian faith like to fight over who's right when it comes to baptism. And not only that, but it also seems that not every single Christian church or denomination holds baptism to the same level of significance. And so so what's going on here? And and also in regards to that, Paul doesn't mention any other church sacraments. He, He doesn't say that we're all united under one Lord's Supper. So it's possible he's talking about water baptism. Uh, Some other people think that Paul could be talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The the idea that the indwelling of the Spirit happens in every single believer. That the Spirit indwells in us. Uh, But the problem with that is that Paul's already mentioned that. He's already said that we are joined together under one Spirit. So why would he bring it up again? He said that in verse 4. Another view is that, is that Paul is referring to the charismatic view of being baptized in the Spirit. Being baptized in the Spirit. Now, just so there's no confusion, what does that mean? Baptism in the Spirit is this charismatic idea that the Spirit comes and fills a believer's life sometime after conversion. And so you get saved, and then you pray that the Holy Spirit will come and baptize you sometime afterwards, right? Sometimes it's soon, but sometimes it can take years after your conversion for the Holy Spirit to finally baptize you. And when that happens, oftentimes in the charismatic belief, you receive the gift of tongues or you receive some other kind of spiritual gifting. It's a crazy, crazy moment. But it's unlikely that Paul's talking about that for two different reasons. Number one, as we've been talking about through the book of Ephesians, Paul believes that we receive the fullness and the complete essence of the Holy Spirit the moment that we surrender to God the moment that we ask Christ into our life we are filled with the Holy Spirit completely and number two this whole idea of being baptized in the Spirit actually wasn't even a widespread belief until the early Pentecostal movement of the 1900s Paul wouldn't have even been privy to this teaching And so it's unlikely he's talking about that. So that leaves only one final interpretation. And this is the one that seems most likely. 
Paul is talking about a metaphorical baptism. A baptism in which all believers are baptized or brought, adopted into the family of God. There are several passages that talk about this, several places in the Bible where it talks about God's people being baptized into the faith, and it doesn't talk about water. It's not talking about actual baptism. One of those is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. We read there, it says, for we were all baptized with one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free. We have all been baptized into one body. That's also Paul. And so it seems like what Paul's talking about, that we all have one baptism that unites us, is that when you surrender your life to Christ and you receive the Spirit, there is an, an, a metaphorical baptism in which you are brought into the family of God. It happens without water. It happens in your spirit. It's a baptism of your faith. Paul says that we are united by one more thing. We are united by one God and Father. We are united as one family under the headship of one Father. God, who is over all things, who works through all things, who is in all things. We are bound together as his children. Which takes us to this next section because we're going to find out that God has equipped his children with gifts that unite us. Picking up in verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. And so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. If you remember back in Ephesians chapter 2, we read the verse that says that we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Paul says in his grace, God has equipped the church to unify us, to strengthen us, and to carry out our calling as Christ apportioned it, Paul says, which kind of sounds weird, but it just simply means there in verse 7 that, that God has gifted us in different ways for different purposes. The giftings he gave you, he did not apportion to me, but in his grace, he lavished his people with gifts to be used as he saw fit. But first, what's all this talk about Jesus ascending and descending? What's all that stuff about in verses 8 and 10? This is that confusing part I, I alluded to at the very beginning. Talk about confusing. What, what in the world is Paul trying to say? Well, if you notice, or maybe if you look at the little notes at the bottom of your passage, the bottom of your page in your Bible, you'll notice that, that Paul's actually quoting a passage from the Old Testament. He, he's quoting Psalm 68 to be specific. And there are books written about this particular passage. It, it's a very unique passage in all of Scripture. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to just kind of boil it all down for you. Really, really simple. In the original text in Psalm 68, it appears that the psalm is painting a picture of God as a conquering king, as a victor of battle. And so as a king who would conquer, he takes captives and he takes spoils of war. But here, Paul quotes that verse, but he alters it and he changes it. He changes the meaning of some of the words so that instead of God taking, it becomes Jesus giving. What's he do here? He points to the fact that Jesus is the king 
who though ascended on high, descended to the lower realm, descended to earth from on high, so that he would rescue the captive, those who are in bondage to sin and death, and so that he might give the spoils and the gifts to his people. Paul says the one who descended has ascended once more. This idea of a future inheritance comes back into the picture because we are told that Jesus who came to die for us was resurrected and ascended and so now prepares a place for us in glory. The one who descended has ascended. Paul tells us that, that Jesus, in his ascension, has left people with giftings and abilities to serve God's people, to serve the church, and to carry out the gospel calling. It says that Jesus has left some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Oh my. <laughs> if you don't know that reference, I'm not going to explain it. The list isn't meant to be exhaustive. In fact, if you go to other places where Paul has written the early church, you will find plenty of conversation and listings of all the spiritual giftings that Paul believes the church has been given. The point isn't for Paul to list every spiritual gift that maybe God has ordained or that Jesus has gifted the church with. The point is that God, through Christ, has equipped his people for the works of service. He has equipped you. Every single one of us born with natural giftings, talents, we, we usually call them. But you have to understand, spiritual giftings are different than just talents. In Scripture, spiritual giftings is what he gives his believers so that they might faithfully encourage and equip the church. That's verse 12. Paul's talking about men and women blessed with spiritual gifts to declare the gospel, to strengthen the church's unity so that they might build one another up. Which, which leaves us with 13 through 16, the last part of our passage for today. He builds us all up, verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work as each part does its work as each believer accomplishes their work as each believer accomplishes their work Paul finishes up by talking about spiritual growth, but specifically to the heart of what he's getting at. He's talking about spiritual growth and the part that our unity plays in our spiritual growth. The part that our unity plays in spiritual maturity and in the health of the church. And the first thing Paul says about this unity relationship with maturity is that unity protects believers from false teaching. One commentary put it this way. Jesus gifted the church not only to function until the body attains the fullness of Christ, but also for the purpose of protecting believers from deception. I'm going to... I'm going to kind of synthesize that even further. Jesus gifted the church for the purpose of protecting believers from deception. He says all this stuff about infancy. 
Because see, the spiritually immature believer is easily swayed by false truths, by deceptive lies, or as Paul puts it in this section, the waves that can toss us back and forth and beat us down. But the spiritually mature Christian is able to discern truth as they are led by the Spirit as they unite with other brothers and sisters in Christ who can encourage them and instruct them as they grow in Christ. As we said Wednesday night during Bible study, when Paul's talking to Timothy, he encourages him to set up a form of discipleship so that no one is walking in their faith alone. In verse 15 and 16, Paul paints the metaphor of Christ as the head of the church and the church as his body. One living, breathing organism joined together with each part performing its proper function in the body so that the body is healthy and is carrying out its purpose, grounded in truth, rooted in love, and growing in maturity. That's the ministry of the church. That's our ministry, church. Our ministry. And our ministry as God's people, as the church, as Plano, isn't left to just one or two individuals. It isn't left to spiritual giants. It is up to every believer doing their part with whatever gifting the Father has given to carry out our calling, to live a life worthy of the calling. We are his church. We are his body. And it's imperative that we are united. That his church is healthy. That means you need me. And I need you. We need each other. Because, Paul says, the world needs us. Pray with me. Father, there's often so much division within your church. It is sometimes shameful to think about how the world views your church and your people because there's so much anger and hurt and bitterness and betrayal. Oftentimes we are the complete opposite of loving one another. And so God, we ask that you would, one, forgive us as we repent before you, but two, Father God, give us that supernatural love for one another that Paul talks about. Father God, it is a blessing that you might unite your people under the, under the title of Plano Baptist Church. But God, we pray that your people around the world, your church, your body, Lord, might be a living, breathing example of your son. Teach us what it means to love. Teach us what it means to have grace and mercy. Teach us what it means to live our truth but to wrap and envelop our truth in love. Father God, we declare that you are Lord. And so, Father God, we ask that we would join under the banner of one Lord. We pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. I read a quote this week as I was preparing, and it said, The truth without love is brutality. But love without the truth is hypocrisy. And so may we live our truth, but envelop it in love. As we love one another. And in reality, 
as we said last week, Paul's entire intent for his church to be unified is so that we might be effective in our calling to love the world and to take the message of the gospel of Jesus' great love and sacrifice to the world. And so join with me, brothers and sisters, in a pledge to protect and guard our unity, to love one another so that we might be faithful in loving the world. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. We're going to have a time of response. However the Lord might be leading you, I invite you to come to the altar. You can pray here. You can come to me and I'll I'll be happy to pray with you. You can also pray where you're at. Um, But we're going to stand and I encourage you to respond as we worship.